quantum supremacy is this very basic scientific question people researching quantum computers have had over the past few decades is basically, can a quantum computer actually do something that a classical computer cannot? Welcome to Hedera Hashgraph's Gossip About Gossip. If you are a developer, an entrepreneur, crypto enthusiast, or just trying to learn more about how distributed ledger technology and Hedera Hashgraph will impact your industry, then you'll love the episodes that we have coming up. Bookmark us, add us to your podcast app, and stay tuned. Hey there, and welcome to Hedera Hashgraph, Gossip About Gossip. I'm Paul Madsen. So it's it's likely you, you heard of a recent announcement from Google last week about what they had achieved, namely something called quantum supremacy, a term I had never heard before. Bitcoin immediately crashed and then, you know, just as illogically surged on another announcement from China. I'm happy to welcome my colleague to help make sense of quantum supremacy and, and its potential impact on Hedera, Atul Likes. Welcome, Atul. How are you? Hi. Thanks, Paul. I'm fine. Thank you. So you're you're head of cryptography at Swirls Hedera. Yes, that's correct. Awesome. So you're you're perfectly positioned to help us understand supremacy and and I guess the broader possibilities, risks, and opportunities of, of quantum computing to both Hedera and DLTs mm-hmm. in general. So before we dig into that, what's your background? How did you come to Hedera? Yeah, I've been doing research in cryptography for the past eight years or so. I did a PhD at the University of Leuven under supervision of uh, Bart Pernil. For those who aren't familiar with the University of Leuven in Belgium, that's where the AES, Advanced Encryption Standard Algorithm, was developed. And while I was there, I focused on the design and analysis of uh, cryptographic algorithms, You know, trying to prove that they're secure. And I've designed a handful of my own cryptographic algorithms. After completing my PhD, I did a postdoc at UC Davis with another cryptographer named Phil Rogaway, where I then focused more on protocols aiming for anonymity. And then I continued at Visa Research, where I then looked at cryptography as relevant to the conventional payments infrastructure. And then uh, I kind of stumbled upon Hedera, you know, where basically you get a much more exciting application of cryptography to a blockchain where cryptography becomes ever more relevant. And over here, I've been continuing my research into cryptography and also kind of working on a consulting basis with various people throughout the company. Awesome. Great to hear. So how how does one become a cryptographer? Were you a a math kid? (laughs) Yeah, I was uh, basically, uh, I've always loved math. I've been programming since I was five years old also. Uh, I studied math in my undergrad and then Cryptography, is, it's a very interesting intersection of math and computer science, where you can actually, you know, be busy with slightly more theoretical math, but then stuff that has a direct impact on the world, actually. Which is definitely true of the possibilities of quantum computing on, on encryption in general or security in general and, and DLTs in particular. Mm-hmm. So let's dig into that. Google announced that they had achieved Quantum supremacy. What does that mean? What is the supremacy? So uh, quantum supremacy is this very basic scientific question people researching quantum computers have had over the past few decades. Is basically, can a quantum computer actually do something that a classical computer cannot? So that, that seems a very pretentious way of saying that a quantum computer can do something presumably faster or better. Exactly than a a conventional supercomputer, perhaps. Exactly. And so what the Google experiment set out to do, or what they claimed, was that here we've designed a quantum computer, okay, which can run an algorithm, which will only take our computer about, you know, three minutes to complete. Whereas if you were to run it on a classical computer, on a regular computer, then it would take 10,000 years. So this clearly demonstrates that Quantum computers can definitely do stuff that classical computers cannot. Right? That's what the Google paper claimed. Okay. So I understand IBM disagreed and contended that that wasn't supremacy. Yes, exactly. IBM's response was basically, so they went into this analysis that Google made 
Google made a few assumptions about classical computers in determining how long it would take a classical computer to solve the problem, right? So this is how Google arrived at their number 10,000 years. They obviously didn't run a computer for 10,000 years to figure that out. So IBM then questioned their assumptions and actually pointed out, hey, if you use these classical computers in this different way, then you could uh, actually solve this problem in two and a half days instead of 10,000 years, okay? So it then doesn't become as clear that Google has illustrated quantum supremacy, right? Whereas with Google's estimate, it's, okay, blatantly clear, 10,000 years versus three minutes. With IBM, you know, two and a half days, then it uh, doesn't become, it's not as clear cut as an answer to the quantum supremacy problem. Sure. It, it sounds like a bit of a nit from IBM, though, <laughs> yes. right? Because it's still, they're still acknowledging <laughs> yes. that Google did something cool, but not that cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, IBM might be a bit jealous, right? Because they have their own 51 qubit computer, and they didn't come out with this first. So yeah, let's come back to qubits and, and the significance of 51. I think Google had 53, so maybe there's competitiveness mm -hmm. there. So whether or not it was two and a half days or 10,000 years, Google's quantum computer was still able to do something faster, some calculation faster than a traditional computer. How? Like, What is the magic in quantum computing that allows it to be that much faster? An analogy I've, I've heard that seems intuitive a tool is that, you know, Classical computing is like heads or tails, right? A, a given coin can be heads or tails. But if you flip it while it's in the air, it's impossible to determine whether it's heads or tails. So in a sense, it's both. And you know, quantum computing is acknowledging that super superposition of heads and tails together at any one time and leveraging that, that blurriness mm -hmm. of the state yeah. of that. Coin. Yes, exactly. Without going into too much detail, so what quantum computers are able to do is they're able to take their state and then go into what's called quantum superposition Okay, of that state. This then allows quantum computers to do many, many different computations in parallel Okay, while they're in quantum superposition. Okay, so that they can explore many different possibilities of how the computation would result. So the trick with quantum computers then is that if you actually want a final result, you're going to have to collapse the superposition down to one, okay, and somehow reduce that uncertainty into certainty. And it's basically through this power of being able to do many different computations at once that you can actually achieve a lot more with quantum computers. Okay. So I, I, I saw an analogy. Uh, if you think about Google Maps or, or any of the map algorithms, the mechanism by which they determine the best route from A to B is effectively try them all and one after another, see, is this better than the next one? And a quantum map algorithm would, in a sense, try them all at the same time and then filter out the answers that weren't good. Is that fair? Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly. That's, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> I've achieved roughly. Okay. So that's, that's in general why quantum computers can be fast. They, they parallel processing to a certain mm -hmm. extent with some cleaning up at the end. And they were able to apply this, or Google was able to apply this sort of generic functionality to solve presumably some obscure math problem that isn't immediately relevant. But quantum computers are also being perceived as presenting a real risk to internet authentication, HTTPS, SSL, et cetera, and crypto, like crypto in the, in the cool sense, <laughs> cryptocurrencies like HBAR and others. Why? What problem will quantum computers be able to address that isn't feasible with a traditional computer? So in this respect, there's actually two types of attacks that quantum computers will be able to do right, once they're around. One of them, which is you know relegated to the far future, let's say, it's where maybe people are using quantum computers on a daily basis, and they're actually running cryptography on those quantum computers. If you have a situation like that, and someone wants to attack you, then they actually have a new avenue. They can try and entangle their computer with your computer and actually recover your keys much faster, actually attack your cryptography much faster. But that, that's uh, like a really futuristic type attack where you know we're, 
Uh, we're running desktop computers, which are quantum or something like that. Okay. Uh, but just to give you an idea, people are even doing research into these types of attacks. Okay. Now then there's the second more serious problem where in the current world, we're running classical computers and we're running cryptography on the classical computers. And then all of a sudden, maybe some large nation states or who knows, some criminal organization, they're able to build a quantum computer. And what they do is they then, you know, maybe they'll collect our internet traffic, or maybe they'll have a look at the Bitcoin or Hedera ledgers and take that information, feed it into their quantum computer, and they'll actually be able to recover the keys in the cryptography used in all that communication, okay? So this is a much more serious problem, the one that people are much more concerned about. There's two very well-known attacks in that situation that people are most concerned about. One is called Shor's attack, and the other is called Grover's. So what Shor's attack allows you to do is you've got your quantum computer, you've collected all this internet communication, you know, for example, TLS communication, bring it in your quantum computer, you perform Shor's algorithm, that allows you to factor the RSA public keys to be able to determine the secret keys, okay, so that you could actually then recover all the keys used in a, in a communication. Then there's Grover's algorithm, which allows you to perform a key search much faster. There's all kinds of cryptographic algorithms out there. There's, I already mentioned uh, one which is based on factorization. There are ones which aren't based on those, like the advanced encryption standard. What Grover's algorithm allows you to do is to brute force search keys much faster. You know, it allows basically a quadratic speed up in how fast you can search for keys on quantum computers. Basically, I was going to say, long story short, if you have a big quantum computer out there, yeah, you're going to be able to factor numbers and a lot of the deployed crypto out there is broken, okay? Thanks basically due to Shor's algorithm. There's Grover's algorithm, which also severely impacts a lot of different cryptography out there as well. But the effect of that, to, to avoid that one, you can just make your keys larger, okay? Because all that Grover's does is just does a big brute force search. If you make your keys larger, then it's going to take a lot longer for them to search for the keys. Okay. So so both those attacks, if I understood correctly, are because of quantum computing speed, or in a sense, just optimization of solving the difficult problems on which modern crypto, non-quantum modern crypto relies, right? Just whether it's factoring a prime or you know brute forcing, as you described, and a quantum computer can just go through that search space quicker. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, and then the, the, the first scenario you described is when it's not modern crypto, RSA, elliptic curve, or otherwise, but some future quantum yeah, yeah. cryptography, and then, then entanglement, and that gets, that gets even weirder, I would, I would think. That gets much weirder. Yeah, the only reason I bring it up is because I've been starting to see much more research happening about that. And you get much more devastating attacks. Okay. But again, your attacker would somehow have to entangle their computer with yours. And I don't know, who knows? It's a kind of a weird situation. Right. So even even with respect to the, you know, the feasibility of the second attack, using quantum against modern crypto, Vitalik Buterin drew the analogy, you know, we've had fusion, we have had nuclear fusion for years. Physicists say it's possible, but we're still burning coal. How far away is that scenario that you described? Yeah. So let's talk about Shor's algorithm. That's the factorization algorithm. So right now, the best computers, uh, best quantum computers that we have are somewhere between 50 and 100 qubits. The best estimates to be able to feasibly run Shor's algorithm is you'd need several thousand qubits, okay? And this is assuming those several thousand qubits, assuming that they work perfectly, okay? There's this problem with a lot of quantum computers nowadays is that they there's a lot of error in the computation. We're all used to classical computers where if you compute a function, okay, if you, if you do one plus one and you do it a million times, you'll always get two. It's not the case with quantum computers. You actually could get errors in your results. So you need to rerun your computations many times. They have um, this process called error correction, basically. If your qubits work perfectly, you'd need several thousand qubits to run Shor's algorithm. 
If you need to use error correction, then you need a few million qubits to be able to run Shor's algorithm. So just to put that in perspective, our best estimates is you need a few million qubits to run Shor's algorithm. We are currently at 50 to 100 qubits. Unless we find a way to significantly, to very quickly scale the size of our quantum computers, it for the foreseeable future, it's, we shouldn't really be concerned about Shor's algorithm. Is it, is it just engineering? Like the, the physics is known and now it's just a matter of resolving the, the technical challenges of... So that's, yeah. So that's what these papers now with, from Google and IBM. So they're, they're kind of solving these scientific problems, the initial problems, showing that, hey, look, this is all feasible and we're able to scale it somewhat. Now getting to really wide scale quantum computers, there are going to be some significant engineering challenges. Okay, well, that's good to hear, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. We've got we've got a ways away. We've got time, right? Yeah. yeah. So, Hedera specifically, if, if the opportunity for a hacker with quantum computing, even acknowledging it's not immediate, it's in the future, if the opportunity is to hack private keys, so Hedera uses private keys both for no signing of events for clients submitting transactions. Which parts of Hedera's algorithm or infrastructure, cryptographic infrastructure, are safe, are quantum safe? So if we very narrowly look at it, okay, so there's the there's the hash graph itself, okay? There's the history of events that have happened and then the hashes being built on top of hashes, okay? So I say the history is protected. It'll be very difficult for people to go back in time and change events, but if the hashing function is is a one way function, is that not vulnerable to optimization? You're you're right. It's vulnerable to Grover's attack. Okay, yeah, that's why I brought up Grover's attack as well. It would be more value vulnerable. But we're using SHA three eighty four. Okay, which is a rather large hash function. So even if you have a huge quantum computer and you want to invert this hash function, it's still going to take a significant amount of time. Just because Grover's algorithm does provide as you know such a significant speed up, Lehman often makes the point that not specifically the hashing function that we're using three eighty four, but in some sense we're using overkill <laughs> throughout the cryptographic choices mm-hmm. that he's made. Yeah, and that gives us a certain future proof. Yeah, that is the case. Although our our signature algorithms are vulnerable, meaning yeah. that uh, you know the signing functionality for transactions for nodes. That would all be vulnerable. Like everybody else, right? Yeah, and that's the point, right? Is that we're not the only ones out there, right? Uh, So there's all of internet banking uh, becomes vulnerable, you know, all apps, all enterprise security. Okay, so it's basically, it's a much, much larger problem than just for Hedera. That's why there's also a significant amount of interest across the industry. So we've talked about the risks that that quantum computing present to DLTs in general or or crypto in general, DLTs specifically. I've also seen arguments that quantum computing could provide an opportunity for crypto in generating, I think, what they call certified randomness. Uh Randomness is, is great in DLTs, particularly if you're trying to elect a leader. Any thoughts there? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you could potentially use it to as a very good source of randomness. Okay, and the fact that it's verifiable, this is this is very new research, right? I think Scott Aronson is also looking into this. I mean, the question is, would you be able to pract- make use of it in a practical way? It's it's hard to say right now, but it definitely looks like a, I mean, a promising research area. Let's put it that way. Okay, fair enough. And of course, Hashgraph, we argue that you don't want a leader in the first place, whether you pick them verifiably, randomly, or otherwise. So I understand there are quantum-resistant alternative cryptographic algorithms. Is it the case that they're less efficient, particularly in the early days, perhaps? Yes, yes. There's been, over the past two decades, a lot of research into designing either they're either called quantum resistant or post quantum cryptographic algorithms and what tends to happen is is it's one of two things either if we take something like signature algorithms right algorithms which sign one thing that happens is the size of the signature becomes huge okay 
which then would significantly increase your uh, communication costs, even if the computation is not so much. On the flip side, there are uh, signature post-quantum signature algorithms where the signatures aren't so big, but then all of a sudden you need to do a lot of computation to be able to verify or sign. Still, you know, I think factor 10, 100 times slower than existing signature algorithms. And this is very much still a research area. But on the flip side, if all of a sudden someone were to say, oh, we've developed a quantum computer, you could, in the worst case, switch to these slower algorithms for your most sensitive operations. That's interesting. Fascinating. Atul, thank you very much for this. I think beforehand, my my state was maybe 50-50 on understanding and knowledge, and you've moved me to the right. I'd say a superposition of 30 and 70, perhaps. So, we, But we'll only find out once we measure your knowledge, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We'll have to quiz. You'll have to quiz me and collapse the, uh, the wave function. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Atul, thanks again. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you for listening to Hadera Hashgraph's Gossip About Gossip. If you like the episode, please subscribe, rate and review, and also share and tell your friends. Or connect with us on social media like Twitter, Instagram, etc. at Hashgraph. Particularly if you want to leave us feedback on the podcast. We look forward to hearing from you.